Hello and welcome to the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center webinar covering flash blindness. My name is Steve Rutherford, and I'm the director of the HDIAC, and today we have the privilege of hosting Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Candela. I am grateful to everyone who's taking time out to join us from, during these challenging times. I'd also like to take a second to thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center. The DTIC IAC mission is to collect, synthesize, produce, and disseminate scientific and technical information to the DOD and federal government users. And this webinar is made possible through DTIC sponsorship. So I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes as we begin. Please note that all the attendee lines have been muted. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them using the attendee chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. We prefer that you just type them right into the chat as opposed to using the question function at the top of the screen. Thank you for that. And we're going to work to save the last 10 minutes or so of this presentation to go over those questions and discuss them. If we to run out of time, we'll make note of all the remaining questions and post responses after the conclusion of the brief. Please also note that today's webinar is being recorded. A link for the recording as well as the slides will be available at our website, www.hdiac.org, for later download. And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Kendellen. Colonel Kandelan has had a fascinating career in the services of the country, and he's been an Army officer with over 20 years of service. He was commissioned in the U.S. Navy in 2000, and during his time as a naval officer, he was certified to operate the S-5W, S-6G, and S-8G submarine nuclear power plants. He then transferred to the U.S. Army in 2007, and he is currently serving as a countering weapons of mass destruction planner at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Jeff recently completed an assignment at the U.S. Army Nuclear and Counter Weapons of Mass Destruction Agency, where he was a senior nuclear weapons effect analyst, lead modeler, and senior intelligence officer. Jeff's unique background has given him extensive experience in submarine tactics, operations, reactor operations, maintenance, as well as training. He holds a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in both strategic intelligence and aeronautical science. It is our pleasure to host Lieutenant Colonel Kandelan today. With that, the floor is yours, Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate your attendance. At, uh, I've flipped through the attendance list, uh, and I see there's a bunch of people here, so I really appreciate you taking your time. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dirk and Amber for helping to put this together, uh, and also the Homeland Defense and Summation Analysis Center. For the lead-in and introduction, uh, so yes, I am an Army officer, uh, and yes, I, I did start at Clear Navy. Uh, I spent eight years driving submarines uh, and, and working nuclear power, and then I transitioned. Uh, oddly enough, uh, Dirk Plant um, was the first person I spoke to in the Army when I started my transition. Uh, and then later in career and mine, uh, he was my supervisor as he retired. Uh, so it's really two thanks to him because uh, he helped many people that got me to where I, where I am today. So I am a functional area 52 officer, which is nuclear proliferation, soon to be named CWMD officer, and his human resources command does a little more administration. But it's given me an opportunity to work with some great people, do some great jobs, uh, and perform some great work. My time in the Army has been spent mostly on the technical side of things. Uh, and, and as we get started, I also want to mention, uh, you'll notice there's no webcam. Uh, I was not able to get the, uh, the adequate hair and makeup support, uh, so we're going to forego that for this event. Just a quick sea story as we get started. Uh, the, when, when a submarine goes to periscope depth, and, and this is somewhat related to the topic we have today, when a submarine goes to periscope depth uh, at night, you do something called rig for red. And that's where all of the lights are turned off, all of the dials and indicators are switched to a red, uh, a red display. Uh, and you do this about 20 minutes beforehand, maybe 30 minutes beforehand, to allow your eyes to adapt to the, the dark. Um, as the officer of the deck brings the, the, the boat to periscope depth, he needs to look out the periscope. And of course, it's, it's dark on the surface of the ocean. So he needs to have that night adaptation when he arrives there. 
as, as a good officer, uh, I was going to do another watch that night, um, and they were rigged for red, so it was very dark in control. And I went to look at my orders for the day, uh, for that evening. Um, and and there, was, there was nothing there. Normally there's some typewritten notes and some handwritten notes uh, for me to, to take care of, whether it's taking out the trash or performing some drills. Uh, there was nothing written, which was which odd, but it was sometimes it happened. Um, so I went about my day. I did my six-hour watch, uh, and then when I got off my watch, I proceeded to get yelled at by the engineer, who had been yelled at by the captain, uh, for not doing any of the jobs that I was supposed to do that evening. Uh, and I went to show him the night order book that had nothing listed in it, and I came to realize that uh, the, the the captain. Uh, had written the orders in red ink. Um, and with the rig for red and my red flashlight, uh, I, w I could not see them. So it was a very awkward event. Uh, I learned a lesson. Uh, I think we, we it's, it's interesting how just day to day we, we do things and don't realize how, how optics is involved and light is involved and, and how intricate of an instrument our eyeballs are uh, in certain circumstances. So a little see story for you. Uh, I'm going to advance. So what we're going to talk about today is flash blindness on the battlefield. Uh, this is based on an article I wrote called the same title for the Countering WMD Journal, which is a journal that USANCA runs, the United States Army Nuclear and Countering WMD Agency, issue 19 from the summer and fall of 2019. Um, and I, I wrote this article because as one of the analysts that you sang, we had been asked this question. Uh, we didn't have any modeling tools. We didn't have any way to answer it. So we, we went to the books, we got some methodologies to, to answer the question and provide a response uh, and went about our day. And, and in looking into it a little more and thinking about it, I, I thought it warranted an article. Um, and there's a lot of great resources out there. So that's where I started, and that's where we will start today. So the agenda, uh, we're, we're going to try to answer this question. What is the risk of retinal burns or flash blindness to friendly troops following a nuclear weapon use? Of course, we have to cover nuclear weapon effects, really focused on thermal, the anatomy, anatomy of the eye and how the eye is impacted uh, or, or the injury mechanisms. We'll discuss a literature review. Uh, and then try to formulate some answer. And what we're really talking about there is the safe separation distances. How far away do I need to be to be safe? And of course, what is safe? Uh, and, and I think there's some, there's some areas for future research which I'd like to investigate. That being said, I think it's important to note that physicians and scientists have known uh, and documented uh, for, for a very long time uh, eye injuries from extremely luminous objects. Uh, there's, there's, in, there, there's documentation back to the 1800s. This is mostly uh, anecdotal evidence from solar eclipses, people looking at solar eclipses without eye protection. And I think we'd all agree that, that today it's common knowledge. So anybody looking at an eclipse without protection uh, would be really ignorant or just outrageously uninformed. Uh, in fact, at, the tr at Trinity, which was the first nuclear weapon test, July 16th, 1945, uh, the, the personnel involved in that test wore protection. But it wasn't really studied until the, the 1950s. So the first topic we're going to hit is the, uh, the thermal effects. So 35% of the nuclear weapon output is thermal, i.e., that's light and heat. Now, what we're talking about here is prompt effects. Uh, that's really defined as effects from the nuclear weapon that occur at that first minute after detonation. But uh, of course, we're concerned with that, the very, few, very first moments. So that thermal energy can extend well beyond the blast and radiation effects. And again, an important caveat, we're, we're not concerned with eye injuries for people who are also burnt to a crisp, uh, uh, have buildings falling on them, and so forth and so on. We're concerned about folks that are many kilometers away from the detonation that may experience eye injuries or temporary blindness. And you can also uh, roll in optical sensors uh, that could be damaged because of their lensing and sensitive instrumentation. Uh, 
Um, there are some also some counterintuitive uh, concepts here. Uh, one is the, the one over R squared concept. So if you have a point source of light or of energy, that light or energy dissipates as a function of one over R squared as you move away from that point source. So I think we're going to find that that's a, that's a very interesting uh, component to add to this discussion. And then also, what role does yield play? It, it, Things to say, well, of course, a one megaton weapon is going to be much worse than a 10 kiloton weapon. And as we'll find, it's not exactly the case. So uh, this next slide is classic Glassstone and Dolan. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the rate of thermal radiation relative scale. And then on the bottom, you have a time after, which is again a relative scale. And there's a story to tell here that you summarize uh, from these, these two peaks. The first peak is as the X rays upon weapon detonation interact with the weapon materials and casing and that very immediate component. It lasts some seconds for a very large one megaton weapon. And the peak accounts for about 1% of the thing. That's sick, again, from the x-rays, uh, which interact with the air in the surrounding region. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to look at my Wi-Fi and hope that my voice continues to get better. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue to look at that, me that messaging. So the second peak um, is, again, from the x-rays interacting with the air surrounding the weapon. It lasts from seconds for tens of kiloton weapons to 10 seconds for megaton weapons. And then that accounts for 99% of the thermal energy. But there's an interesting story to be told here um, because that, that first pulse accounts for the fission products created by the explosion, their kinetic energy, the collision with the atoms surrounding where electrons are being stripped from those atoms, uh, electrons are being excited within those atoms, and it's emitting a strong electromagnetic or thermal energy in the form of x-rays. This is causing temperature to go up tremendously high and pressure to go up tremendously high and accounts for that first pulse. What you've created there is an environment of millions of degrees Celsius uh, and, and tremendous pressure of gigapascals. And as that fireball gets larger, those, those same x-rays are able to travel further because their mean free path is now longer in that environment. So now those x-rays are interacting with the air around the weapon, and that's where you get that second pulse. So this is very complex. You can't just take this chart and, and start integrating or, or take that 1% or the 99% and, and draw significant conclusions. Uh, the yield matters. The yield to mass to mass ratio matters. Uh, the, the spectrum's being put off by the black body radiation. There's different you need to take into account. There's the opacity, uh, the, the breakaway, which is that, that first lower peak where you can see the interior fireball. Uh, and then, of course, there's uncertainty in the fireball size. You have that classic Glassstone and Dolan equation for fireball size or, or safe height of burst, which is the height of burst is equal to 180 uh, times whiskey, which is the yield, to the power of 0 0.4. But that equation itself has a error of th plus or minus 30 percent so so it it's a very informative it tells a powerful story but it's not something you can just immediately start applying and and, and doing calculations on so as we move forward we need to deal with the um the anatomy of the eye so the iris which is that portion of the eye at the top of the diagram that, that gets uh, larger and, and smaller or, or narrower and wider in the dimensions on the heart. Um, and then there's the lower portion of the, that contains the rods and cones. So the fovea, which is where the eye focuses what you're looking at, sort of hard to describe, but it, it, that's where the visual acuity of the 
eye is. It also uh, contains a lot of the, the cones uh, and is where you, you understand color. Uh, as so elsewhere in that retina, it's rods and cones. So there's a little bit of gray visibility. The acuity is not as well, but it's good for noticing some movements. Now we need to start talk vision, and that's where the eye, based on a change in the photopigment and the chemicals, and the sit above the iris gets quite a bit, um, and that, that pupil is now 16 times larger. It's allowing 16 times more light than the daytime. Of course, we have protective features of the eye. There's a redundancy, which is very important, and then also our eyelids. So th this is an interesting discussion. Reviewing a paper for Dr. Blake and, and, and a contractor at Hey, one of the things we got in discussion on is, is the blink reflex. Um, and frankly, like an optometrist or an optometrist would say the blink, blink reflex is the, is the shot of the eye. So what we need to talk about here is really the, the time. Um, closure reflex and blink reflex or the optical reflex or the track, which would be a reaction to being slapped um, or, or some other stimulus to the face where you're, you immediately try to protect your eye. So what we're really talking about here is eyelid closure. This sort of gets to the human factors element here, which we'll, we'll, we'll discuss later. So here we are back to this, this curve from Glassstone and, and Dolan, um, and we're going to introduce a little bit of information. So I'm just going to do a quick check on the sound. Is the sound still breaking up? Or a message from my... Um, I, will, I, I haven't done anything. I'm going to do my best to proceed. Um, Okay, I'm I'm going to press on, and I'm just I'm looking at this little yellow connectivity thing. All right, we are going to press on, and we're on this slide. This is the classic das, uh, uh, Glassstone and Dolan, and what we're going to insert is some information to try to tell our story. So, if you assume point A uh, is a one megaton weapon at time A. And then point B is a 10 kiloton weapon at time B. What you can have for some weapon yield pairs is that these times are equal. As in that large weapon, that large one megaton weapon has only completed that first peak uh, by time TA. And at that same TA or TB, you've, th that 10 kiloton weapon has completed that first peak and a portion of the, the second peak. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide to, to help out a little more. So this is the time after detonation on the y-axis. Uh, and then the lower axis, the x-axis, is the yield. You note the log um, scales there. That very lower line is the time to the first thermal pulse maximum. The blue line, time to first thermal pulse minimum, and then time to the second thermal pulse maximum. We've also added in that 0.1 second blink reflex and 0 0.25 second blink reflex. The, I've also added in points A and B, and you can see that point A being that one megaton weapon, and then point B being the 10 kiloton weapon. And you can see that that lines up perfectly, nearly, with that 0 0.1 second from detonation. Um, and the story here is that when you're considering the question, which is does yield, uh, it's that the, the rate is very important. And in this case, we're talking about calories per centimeter squared. Uh, so when something is heated, whether it be house siding, a car, or an eyeball, that material wants to dissipate the heat. And if the intense heat is delivered over a short time, or the rate is very high, 
Um, the thing in question, the, the house siding car eyeball, will reach and go past the combustion point or a point of physiological damage. Uh, Glassstone and Dolan explain this very well if you're following along on page 287, where they discuss the ignition of fabrics. Uh, and, and a really profound example is where they talk about khaki material, and that this is fabric, so khaki material, where they say a 35 kiloton weapon will ignite khaki material based on a 20 calorie per centimeter squared uh, incident uh, rate. But a 20 megaton weapon requires double that, or 40 calories per centimeter squared. And again, it has to do with the rate. Um, so weapons of 100 kilotons or less can complete both peaks and deliver thermal radiation by the, time, by the time the observer executes an eyelid closure at about 0.1 seconds. So for larger weapons, the buildup doesn't occur. The eye is able to shut and protect itself from that incident thermal energy. So the, the question is, does yield matter? And yes, it does. The lower yield weapons are more of a risk to personnel. Uh, because they, um, because the thermal energy at a faster rate. So now we need to talk about what actually happens to the eye. So there's two components that we're going to focus on. One is the temporary blindness, flash blindness, and the second is the injury, um, the retinal burn. So before we, we jump into these definitions, I think it's important to note that as outlined here, and then out, as outlined in my paper, uh, th these are the best way to present the definitions. They're most and discusses a term called glare. But glare is only a factor when the source is present which I find like a very puzzling term to enter into this, um, this discussion. There was also a while where researchers in the term uh, they, they didn't like the connotation of blindness. Uh, they didn't want to have to tell soldiers that they would be blind because uh, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's a term and, uh, and it's permanent, although it's not. So they, they introduced the term of dazzle. I'm not sure, but it was during the 70s, so maybe the, the solution had something to do. But I think that the definitions here are, are where, are, are the best presentation of the information based on a majority of the resources. So we'll start off with flash blindness. Again, a temporary blindness induced by the photochemical bleaching um, caused by extremely bright light. It's experienced by two phenomena. One is dazzle, the term. Dazzle is a more general term for the bleaching of the rods and cones throughout the retina due to an intense light from the fireball in this case. Now, the fireball does not need to be in the field of view for this to occur. That, the next term is the after image, which the fireball is in the field of view. And the after image, the best way to de describe that is the, um, if, if you're to have a picture taken of you with a flash, that flash goes off and that little white spot where the flash was that you retain for a minute or two, um, that is the after image. Now a flash from a camera or a flash from a nuclear weapon are going to be vastly different. And this gets to this last point that during the day, when the eyes are adjusted, flash blindness can last from seconds to minutes after the light source is removed, as the rods and cones have time to chemically recover. At night, it's much worse. Uh, and the flash blindness can last minutes to hours, even days, as the rods and cones recover and the light has and then your eye has to readapt to night vision. And as I said earlier from my little C story, you have uh, about 20 to 30 minutes to really adapt to night vision. So the next term is retinal burn. This is permanent uh, and it is an injury to the tissue because it's heated. So quite literally, that thermal energy deposits the energy 
um, on the retina and raises the surface temperature and, and causes injury uh, so that the, the rods and cones in that area are gone. They are destroyed uh, and there's, there's no repairing. Um, this is due to both the focuses and the sensitive of the retina. So to burn the retina, is, is magnitude is less than what would be required to burn the skin. The second question about the one over R. So, yes, as we said, the, the thermal energy from the weapon paint as a function of one over R squared from the, from the fireball, but the lens counteracts that. So, it undoes that one over R squared relationship. Radiance. So the, in the image of the fireball is independent from the distance. The, so the only thing that's that's incident on the eye is atmospherics. So that's that's smog, that's clouds, that's other other atoms in the atom. Very interesting. So a quick literature review. I think it's important. Lines and eye injuries. They, they have been through a lot of great sources listed at the end of EM1 Chapter 14, uh, the references I used in my article, and then Glassstone and Dolan. That there is a huge list at the end of that, that book. Uh, but it really is focused on aircraft and airmen at cruising altitude. Even when you look at the assumptions uh, and components of these resources, they were really focused on airmen. Um, so what I tried to do for this research, that information, review the assumptions and do my best to translate it to ground force scenarios. Um, and I, I would refer to even um, uh, Glassstone and Dolan, the, the eye injury uh, and flash blindness section in that book, were um, a parts of one kiloton to one megaton, but the first is in feet and 50,000 feet. So I think to that last bullet on the slide, what we, what we really need is, is meaningful scenarios to, to ground personnel. Um, the, obviously, the, um, the height of burst is going to elongate the, the, um, your distance to the horizon and how far away you can see that, that detonation. So to discuss the, the assumptions that were um, very widely used throughout the resources, uh, they were essentially used over and over again. They considered a blink time of 0 0.25 seconds, uh, which is considerably longer than the 0 0.1 seconds, so it's very, very conservative. There's a vil visibility of a 100 kilom outrageously clear day. And then also, I, I, I took into account the information available for a 1,000-foot height of burst. Um, there were additional safety factors that were hard to really determine how they were implemented and how they were used, but there were safety factors associated with extrapolations from animal testing data, visual acuity of personnel, and iris color. Um, the, the flash blindness safe, system, um, safe separation distances, and that's the distances we're, we're working towards, were based on a 10-second recovery time to read a gauge, again, very airman-focused, um, and then the retinal burns were based on receiving no permanent damage. Uh, and again, it was hard to find resources existing for calculating safe separation distances for personnel on the ground in meaningful scenarios. Um, and, it, and as I did this, as I looked at the assumptions, as I focused in on the flash blindness and really not retinal burn, um, the 10-second recovery I, I found to be useful. Um, yes, that was applied to an airman trying to read a gauge on an aircraft, but I think a, a soldier performing duties, whether it driving or engaging the enemy, uh, a 10-second recovery time is, is a conservative way to view safe separation distances when you also incorporate these other assumptions. So this is, with. This is using the assumptions we, we just described. That's the 1,000-foot uh, 
detonation height of burst, 0 0.25 seconds uh, eyelid closure time. Uh, visibility is listed with respect to each resource. Uh, and then uh, this is daytime. So on the y-axis, safe separation distance in kilometers. On the x-axis, we have yield in kilotons. And you might note that the Ritchie 1976 uh, resource ha has some strange kilometers. That's 25 nautical miles and then five nautical miles. So th there's general agreement to the, the shapes of the curves. The, the numbers are quite a bit different, but, but so is the visibility. Um, and what I was also able to do is, is add in some other resources, uh, such as EM1 and then uh, joint pub 3TAC 12.2. The dilemma was that they are not public release. They, they were, I believe, distribution statement C in some other cases, just not cleared for public release. So, so my limitation in this article and, and what, I'm, what I'm displaying here is things that were distribution statement A. Um, Alan, I'll point out from 1968, this is the data that Glassstone and Dolan used for their curves, uh, although the curves are just, they're applied in a completely different manner. Um, so I was able to use the Allen data to get back to a height of burst of a thousand feet and, and use this, use the work. So we're going to flip down to the next slide, which is the night. So we started with day. This is night. You can see the visibilities are the same and the, these, it's hard to notice, but they have uh, gone up quite a bit. And I'm going to skip to the next slide and just put everything together for you. Uh, a little formatting there, issue there on the, on the x-axis, but, but I think you can see the information. The first four charts, excuse me, the first four lines um, are at night, quite a bit higher. Uh, and then the, the lower four are, are for daytime. And what you see is you have the, the pupil again 16 times larger um, and then that recovery for for night vision uh, being implemented here and the recovery needing to take place so so the safe separation distance at night are quite a bit higher than day um, I'll also note that at a height of burst of a thousand feet and a per Average height, the, the distance to, to at which point you're over the horizon based on the curvature of the Earth is about 60 kilometers. So I find it interesting that that, that flash is so bright that you need to be uh, almost on the other side of the horizon uh, from that weapon uh, in order to be safe, again, according to these safe separation distances and at night. So we'll move on to the, the major takeaways here. I think retinal burns, as I did sort of gloss over, we, we defined it, we, we, we understood it, but it, it's, it's not a factor. Um, we're, we're talking about flash blindness uh, or, or eye injuries on the battlefield. And unless a soldier, um, a, a, a lowly soldier, unfortunately, just happens to be looking at that weapon detonation up in the sky, it's a very, very unlikely that they would have some permanent injury, whether at day or, or night. I think that assessment is supported by the information um, from, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those weapon detonations where there were very few permanent injuries. And I think what contributes to this is you have uh, people who, it, it, again, unlikely they would be looking directly at the weapon, um, and then they're able to respond, as in close their eye, protect their eye from, from that bright uh, image of the fireball. The next item there, the flash blindness, uh, is it a concern? I, I would say absolutely yes. Um, the, the impact can be minimal to profound, uh, and I think during the day you're looking at a few seconds to a few minutes if you're inside that least separation, that safe separation distance, and at night, Inside the safe separation distance, you could be looking at minutes to hours uh, of recovery. So if you take those two elements, and if, and if a commander is asking this question that uh, in blue weapon or U.S. weapon, the commander is going to say, 
I don't have any troops nearby, but what about the, these folks over here? They're going to be impacted. And I think the, the end result there is that you would want to take some precaution uh, if available. Of course, the human factor here, uh, th there's a colleague of mine who has since retired. Uh, he, he was a nuclear artillery uh, warrant officer, and he would uh, tell the story of, of his training. So when, a, when he was trained, that when a, the, the flash happened, um, you, you close your eyes and you get down. Um, and he would joke as he was briefing and say that um, today uh, that, that training doesn't exist. Uh, so soldiers out in the field, they're not going to know what to do. Um, and then he would joke about the, the nuclear selfie um, or, or somehow giving, getting your buddy here so that the mushroom cloud looks like a chef's hat on top of your head um, and it's, it's sort of jocular and it, it, um, but I think there, there's a training element here and I did try to take that into my, into account as I wrote the article um, in saying that the, these assumptions are so uh, so conservative that they account for that so as a soldier today might notice a flash instinctively close their eye uh, and then open it again to see what's going on. The the hope is that they would be winced or looking down or, or, or do some other physiological response to, to minimize that impact. But the human factor is is a interesting unknown to add into this these equations here. The next element is is night vision goggles. And I in thinking about this, I found this very interesting. Um, this is from a PEO soldier. This is the latest and greatest uh, enhanced night vision goggle binocular uh, that's available to the force. It, it, it is out in the field. Uh, I'm not sure how widely, but, but it is being used. It is fielded. Uh, and I think these four pictures tell a story that obviously night vision goggles are used at night. Um, and in this first picture in that top left, you see that this, this soldier is being forded one, protection in the sense that the light from the flash of the nuclear weapon uh, is, is being blocked by this, this piece of equipment. But in addition, uh, th this soldier, in using night vision goggles, does not adapt to night vision. Uh, there, there's no adaptation is, is, that takes place because the screen, the, the optics itself, uh, the display is, is too bright. Um, so, so there's two portions here that are protecting this soldier. The older versions of the system either came in binocular version or monocular version. So that lower right graphic uh, is also informative that in this case, the soldier might have one good eye, as in the, the, the eye using the night vision goggles, and then the other eye might need to recover uh, quite a bit. Um, so I think that that speaks to the old equipment that we were using. It speaks to this new equipment. And I think another interesting portion of this is that when a night vision, what night vision goggles do is that they, they amplify existing light. So where a night vision goggle would take a star and amplify it by 100,000 times, um, it, it is not going to do that to a nuclear weapon flash, thankfully. Um, th there's systems in place. They're called... Um, uh, auto game control systems, uh, and and they will protect the user. So I think this is an interesting dynamic that at night, uh, the, the soldiers wearing night vision goggles are going to be afforded a, a lot of protection. Uh, how much is hard to say, but I, I think a lot more than, than if you're not wearing them. So, so again, back to this last takeaway, I just want to review these counterintuitive principles, the one over R squared concept, um, that the, the weapon itself and the thermal output is dissipating over one over R squared, uh, but the lens of the eye is undoing that. And I, I just find that very, very interesting. So, so the limitation for that, that incident thermal energy is really the atmospherics, um, the, the interactions as that thermal energy is, is reaching the observer. Uh, and then the yields. Uh, again, the, the lower, yields wep lower yield weapons deliver thermal energy um, at, at a higher rate and are therefore uh, more impactful than the, the higher yield weapons. Uh, Counterintuitive, um, but, but supported by um, the resources. 
So I think there's some room for follow-on research, uh, and I've, I've been hindered by the, the STARS system, if you're familiar with it, um, being down for quite some time. Uh, and what I'd like to do is take some of the research I've already done, and I think there, there's some programs out there that, that help with some aspects of this, but look at the sensitivity of optical sensors. Um, once you start talking about vulnerabilities, it gets classified very quickly. So I think it, it, if you simply talk to a, a square centimeter and, and discuss the incident light or incident thermal energy, um, again, well outside of blast, well outside of radiation impacts, but you'll find that same one over R squared problem, and it's perhaps worse based on the optics and the lenses being used. And then the CMOS sensors, which will be sensitive to that, that thermal deposition, those sensors that turn the light or the image into, into digital information. Uh, I think it, it'd be interesting to look at, um, we'll figure out the, the thermal uh, units involved and then, and then translate those to the, the, the acquisition and the R&D folks. Um, in, in some discussions with the night vision lab and, and some of these other smart folks that, that work on these systems, these, uh, these optical systems, um, I, I'd like to do a comparison of, of nuclear weapon thermal output, uh, again, out at the, the flash blindness retinal burn area versus plasma cutter output at a reasonable distance, a, 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 few, a few meters away, uh, and then also flashbang grenades. Uh, plasma cutters use a very wide, or they emit a very wide spectrum of light, but it's also very intense in the blue light region, whereas a nuclear weapon is, is intense in the, the ultraviolet um, and, and obviously other spectrums. Uh, so it, it'd be interesting to do a comparison there. And then also flashbang grenades, uh, very intense um, 19 million candela. I, I don't think that's what the, the Mark 20 puts out, but but there's a, uh, I guess people are trying to make the latest and greatest flashbang grenades. Um, and and I, I saw one on the internet that was at that that level. The, the point being that, it, again, in discussions with, with some of these smart folks at the night vision goggle lab is that they've already made adjustments based on plasma cutters. Uh, breachers, um, these are army uh, military personnel that, that are breaking down doors uh, to conduct their missions. They, they use equipment like this. Uh, obviously, flashbang grenades have their application, but to understand the impact um, and comparison between a nuclear weapon, um, maybe it's profound, uh, maybe it's, it's not a big deal. But I think if, if you look to that last bullet, it, this information would be informative to the sensor program offices, the, uh, the R&D folks, uh, and then the survivability efforts. Uh, and if you're familiar, familiar with survivability, this isn't a component as in flash blindness, retinal burn type effects uh, on equipment. It, it's, not, um, it's not something that the survivability folks look at a lot. Um, so I think this is some interesting follow-on research. I'd love to get to back into STARS and start pulling down some, some resources because uh, there's, there's a lot out there. Uh, I've just been held up a little bit. Uh, and with that, I think I'm just about done. These are the sources, uh, some of them. Uh, obviously, my paper has some other sources, uh, and there were little notes throughout the brief uh, down at the bottom right where I was drawing from or stealing things from and, and so forth. So with that, uh, I am at 43 minutes, which I'm, I'm happy about. That's where I was aiming for. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I, I really appreciate the, the HDIAC uh, putting this together. And I'm going to wait for how the questions are going to work. Thanks. Hey. hey, Jeff, this is Steve. Again, thank you very much. You know, I, I, I do appreciate your time as well. The time you took out what I know is a busy schedule to put these slides together and talk to us about your research. Really grateful for that. And we did get several questions, so we'll go ahead and start working through those with the time we have left remaining. Um, Brian Kimball asks, does the closed eyelid have a high enough OD to offer a sufficient level of protection? And then Michael Foster followed up with like that, followed up with that question. He was curious about, is there an agreed upon level that is sufficient in industry? Did you run across anything like that in your research? 
So thanks for the question. The the eyelid piece, uh, I I actually joked a few months ago that like I have very thin eyelids because I have to sleep with a sleeping mask because I need to sleep in complete darkness. Um, but I, I I say that sort of jokingly. I did not run across anything that that signified that closing the eye would not afford appropriate protection um, or that it was somehow thought about in the, hey, wait, hey, maybe the eyelid's not enough um, and you can still get some, some damage. So I would, um, I, I don't, I think the eyelid is, is an appropriate um, protection. Uh, and I, I didn't get the second part of that question. Could you repeat that? Um, yeah, I sure can, Jeff. It was a follow-up. Michael Foster asked, uh, when we talk about sufficiency and what he means is, you know, if we say the eyelid is sufficient, he asks if there is an agreed upon level of cal per centimeter square that is considered acceptable in industry. So the, there is. Um, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. I, I'm more familiar with the uh, the burn calories and, and the PSI to, to puncture lungs and and, and blow out eardrums and things like that, because that, that's more what we're concerned about from a USANCA standpoint, from, from personnel injuries, and can I accomplish military objectives? Um, it's, it's in the research, uh, and I, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't have those numbers on the top of my head, though, but, um, yeah, sorry. So if there's another question coming, I'm not hearing it. Am I still on over? Yeah, Jeff, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. Okay. So Jeff, we had several questions on SSD. Um, Gerald Epstein asks, if low-yield weapons are more dangerous in terms of flash blindness than high-yield for the reasons that you've offered, why does the SSD increase with yield? And he says that some of the curves show that they flatten out, but none appear to turn down as the yield increases. So th this is an this is an outrageously interesting question, uh, and I knew this would come up, and I did my best to prepare for it, uh, and and I started to confuse myself as I prepared for it. You're right, as those curves do increase, uh, and when you look at Richie, and you look at Alan, um, and unfortunately, the, the copies of those documents I have are, are not in great shape. They're, they're hard to follow. Uh, and when you look at the curves, and then you, you go farther, what I wanted to do was extend the curves to, to th 300 kilotons, uh, a megaton, 10 megatons. Um, and what happens is, is the, the weapons themselves stagnate, uh, as, as in they, they go horizontal. Uh, for the safe separ for the safe separation distances, for the example that that I analyzed again, a thousand feet height of burst, 0.25 uh, eyelid closure, so forth and so on. The, what I kept reading, so th those are the curves. What I kept reading, uh, and this is in Glassstone. I can find you the page number. It's it's uh, it's in the flash blindness section. But Glassstone, with, which is really just rewriting Allen, uh, says that. Anything less than 25 miles, as in a height of burst, and, and less than um, 100 kilotons. Sorry, I'm going to say that over again. So anything less than tw anything le with a height of burst of less than 25 miles and greater than 100 kilotons, the eyelid closure is going to protect the eye uh, because the buildup is so slow. Uh, unfortunately, when you look at the charts, it's it doesn't really support that, um, and it's it's. Um, I think that's a matter of just the 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 way the the curves were generated and the assumptions that were presented, because some of the curves that were presented they had eyelid closures up to five seconds. So you're just sitting there with your eye open and this bright flash existing. And, and, and the bright flash is still there because it's, it's a megaton level weapon um, and that, that's going to exist for, for 10 to 12 seconds. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's just, 
it's like noise in their analysis. And it's, it's a really interesting question. And, uh, and it's, and it's, it's conflicting that the text over and over again, um, Glassstone included almost doesn't match the, the safe separation curves. So it, it, I, I'd honestly like to know who, who asked the question and, and maybe we can do that offline if, if maybe they're a little bit smarter than me on this uh, and they've um, cracked the code on that because it's, it's fascinating. Um, thanks, over. Yeah, Jeff, the questioner was Gerald Epstein. Gerald, if, if you're willing, you can do a private to the presenters in the chat and give an email address if you'd be interested in talking with Colonel Condellan about it some more. Um, so our next question, Jeff, uh, Peter Smith, he, he asks, what recovery time did you assume was unacceptable for ground forces in the flash blindness SSD calculations compared to the 10-second gauge reading for air crew? So uh, all I, uh, these resources over and over again used that 10-second that dial gauge recovery time. Um, and so it, it wasn't, I, I didn't go off and try to use something different. What I said to myself was I, I said that the, the eyeball for that gauge reading is, is using the fovea, which is going to be blinded out. And what is a soldier going to do? Well, a soldier is going to be looking out uh, a scope. He's going to be driving a vehicle. He's going to need to see an enemy out of the corner of his eye uh, or some sort of movement that's going to trigger a response. Um, and, and what I said to myself was, I, I think 10 seconds and, and gauge reading is appropriate for the, 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 the soldier um, for those reasons. Uh, unfortunately, if I had said to myself, that's unacceptable, um, I, I think it should be five seconds or 20 seconds, I, I, would, have, I would have been lost because uh, the, the, the data, the resources don't support that type of analysis. Um, so it, it's a, that's an interesting question, and, and, and probably people have different opinions, but I, uh, I believe that the 10-second recovery time was, was good, uh, along with those other assumptions. Over. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So you know you're talking about height of burst and height of burst, and uh, Thomas Stagliano asked if you if you took into consideration the curvature of the Earth when you're evaluating real SSDs. Yes. So the, the this was not straight line, um, it, and what also got confusing was that some resources uses used slant range. So that's from the weapon itself. Uh, that's a thousand feet in the air to the person, and then some resources use the 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 ground distance. So the um, the ground zero, as Glassstone defines, is the point on the Earth um, below or above the where the weapon detonates. So some resources did that ground zero on the surface of the Earth, uh, and then some resources did the, the slant distance. So fighting through all that and making sense of it, um, but when you're also talking about kilometers or, or tens of kilometers, it, it almost doesn't matter. Um, and, and as you saw in the charts, the, there's a lot of um, differentiation, it, it, especially with the, uh, the visibility. So th there are concerns, um, there are things you should be concerned about and, and things that like, okay, that's, that's just noise in the system and, and I, I can't really deal with that. So I think visibility is one of them. Uh, Glassstone says that if, if, it's, if it's a clear day, use those charts. If it's not clear, uh, cut those safe separation distances in half. Um, and, and it's, so it's, um, yeah, I hope that helps. Over. So um, interesting question from Gabriel Mikas. He asks, are there any indications of retinal burn being or other eye damage that occur from the um, radiation of the microwave band? I'm going to punt on that one. I, uh, the, the, <laughs> spectrum, the spectrum thing is, is complicated uh, because of what happens in the atmosphere, what the weapon is putting out. Uh, and things like that. So, so the microwave region, uh, region uh, on the eye, I am not going to be able to talk intelligently about. So, 
Um, moving on, Ray Amante, he asks about moisture content, particulate matter in the air, both near the burst as well as between the burst and then at the viewer. Does that have any resulting effects? So, so a absolutely. The, uh, w we talked about the one over R squared uh, and then how the lens counteracts that. But the, the atmospherics are going to have a, a tremendous effect. Um, again, Gl Glassstone uh, does, does a quick summary where he, he says, whatever the charts he put together and, and everybody always forgets about Dolan's Glassstone and Dolan. I, I, I try to, I try to be faithful to both of those guys who wrote an outstanding, uh, outstanding book, but, but they say that it, you cut it in half, um, based on cloudy. So, so as an, as an, well, as I, in the job I used to have as an, as an analyst, you always look for worst case. Uh, but, but some smart person told me one time, we, we don't model miracles. Um, we, we just model worst case. Uh, so if, if you're going to ask me a question, uh, I'm going to put together some assumptions that make sense to me. I'm going to get them vetted by some other smart people. Uh, and and here's, your, here's your generalized worst case, but with no miracles involved. Uh, and I think that's what the assumptions put together with, with that outrageous visibility. But of course, uh, if, if you're going to introduce cloudy weather, uh, rain, or, or any other environmental factor, um, th those safe separation distances, safe separation distances, are going to be uh, decreased quite a bit. Over. So along those lines, and it may have been uh, a moment when your your comms were breaking up just a little bit. Albert Musa asked, "Do you kind of go over how the lens?" counteracts with that one over R squared distance. If you could kind of cover that just briefly again, I think he that's what he's looking for. So the the lens, um, I, I I'm I'm trying to revert back to the resources because because Alan and and these other folks are, are way smarter than me. Uh, I think the, the it simply put um, it, the, the, the lens takes all that light that, that was dissipated and focuses it. Um, it's, it's sort of like trying to burn a leaf with a, a magnifying glass on a sunny day. Um, you take that magnifying glass, you kind of find that sweet spot, um, and, and you can really raise the temperature uh, from that sunlight. And I think the, the same thing happens with the eye. The eye is, is a, a very... Uh, a very interesting piece of optical equipment, and it uh, does a great job of, of focusing that light on that one spot in the fovea um, where the other light is getting bounced around so that you can see your, your you know, 120 degrees uh, horizontal and 200 vertical, I think it is. Um, so I, th I think it really is as simple as a lens. I, I didn't see any calculations or, or, or convex or concave and, and and angles, uh, but over and over again, I, I saw that the undoing of the one over R squares, one, the, excuse me, the undoing of the one over R squared concept, over. So I think we've got time for one more. So I'll kind of wrap it up with a question from Dr. Ragish uh, Malhotra. Um, in your research, and as you worked with the guys at um, PEO Soldier and that sort of thing, did, did you come across any, any discussions or were there any types of things where maybe the, there could, you could make a contact lens that would protect the eye um, or some sort of adaptation that a soldier could use to mitigate the uh, possibility of retinal damage? So my response there would be uh, – the answer is no. Uh, that, that's not something I looked into. Uh, I know there, there's plenty of equipment out there for pilots. I'm not quite sure how, how it's used. I, I know sometimes the, the bombers will, will fly around with a uh, one eye patched in order to preserve that eye in case they encounter a flash. Um, but I, I think the, the one safety feature that, that I didn't talk about and, and didn't include um, was, was sunglasses. Uh, most soldiers are out there wearing sunglasses. Uh, the environments they're in uh, to keep dust out of their eye and so forth and so on. So that's going to afford some protection. I, I don't think contact lenses are appropriate because that's just going to introduce um, – now the, the contact lenses 
and I don't wear them, so I don't know these terms, but it's, it's moved or it's slipped or it's flipped or, uh, so I think, uh, sunglasses, a kind of a simple solution that's widely in use already. Um, and then at, at nighttime, it's, it's really a matter of, uh, just, just best casing things, uh, paying attention to those safe separation distances, but the night vision goggles, like I said, those help too. Over. All right, Jeff. That's uh, thank you again so much for fielding fielding all those questions for us. I, I think there were a number of questions, and I think there's a lot of interest in your presentation, your research. So thanks a bunch to everybody who took time out to join us today and listen to Jeff's presentation. Thanks a bunch. As we mentioned at the beginning of the today's webinar, the slides recording this presentation will be made available for download at www.hdiac.org. While we're on the topic of the website, if you're interested in learning more about the HDIC or getting involved as a subject matter expert, presenter, or expanding your presence in our user community, please feel free to reach out directly using the contact information that will show up on the left-hand side of the screen. In addition to these monthly webinars, the HDIAC also offers monthly podcasts that span the range of our eight technical focus areas. We publish a bi-weekly email digest with the latest scientific and technical news in the Homeland Defense community, as well as providing a technical inquiry service with up to four free hours of tech consulting. If you are active in the Homeland Defense community and are interested in joining our subject matter expert community, please reach out to us directly. Our subject matter experts like Jeff contribute in a variety of ways, including presenting these webinars, providing these podcasts, and being and acting as consultants as needed on technical inquiries that we receive. So again, our contact information is included in the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. Thank you for joining us today. We certainly value your time, and we wish you best regards and stay well.